We have with us today Henry Sondheimer and uh, Ed Salzberg, as I say, many of you. I'll give a brief introduction, and uh, they'll each speak for 15, 20 minutes, and then we'll have time for ample discussion. Maybe we'll take a few questions after Ed, and then a few questions uh, after uh, Henry particularly, and then uh, mix it up right across. So um, I'll introduce uh, both now, and they'll proceed in that way. Ed Salzberg uh, is the Director of Health Workforce Studies at the, uh, at the Institute, and his appointments in the School of Nursing emphasizing the interdisciplinary, interscholastic nature of uh, our work. Um, Ed is probably known to you for his, well, it could be any of his number of workforce centers. He's founded three of them, quite extraordinary, and the, as such is probably the leading researcher, re research scientist in the field of health workforce, particularly physician health workforce in the United States. Back in 1984, uh, he founded a, a, a health workforce center at the School of Public Health at the University of Albany affiliated, uh, the State University of Albany, affiliated with the State Health Department, also uh, was a bureau within the State Health Department, and ran that for um, uh, almost 20 years, and really set up the model for state health workforce uh, research and analysis there. He was recruited by AAMC to come here uh, in 2004, and set up a health workforce uh, center at the AAMC, which uh, has uh, proceeded uh, in a very contributory way since then, uh, now hosting annual conferences and participating in leading work in the health workforce uh, and the medical health workforce arena, medical workforce arena in particular. Cleese Erickson is with us, followed Ed as director of that center, and followed Ed to GW, becoming a <laughs> power unto itself. Uh, and finally, in uh, 2010, feeling the, uh, the, the power of the new Obama administration, uh, Ed went to the federal government to be the founding director of the National Center for Health Workforce Analysis in, uh, at uh, HRSA. Uh, HRSA, and particularly the Bureau of Health Professions, now Bureau of Health Workforce, had been the leading federal uh, point of analysis for health workforce, going back to the Bureau of Health <laughs> Manpower from the 1960s. But it never had reached the level in federal law uh, that uh, was described by the legislation founding that. And Ed took it over, probably under-resourced, I'm sure he would agree, but really laid down the, the tracks for the work that they did and are doing now. So um, that's Ed. Henry Sondheimer comes to us also from AAMC, but uh, started uh, uh, at PNS where he went to medical school and uh, uh, Colorado and the University for uh, the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto where he did his pediatric and pediatric cardiology training. Uh, he was at Upstate Medical Center in Syracuse from 1976 to 1985 on faculty, and then from 85 to 2002 at the University of Colorado, where not only was he a leading pediatric cardiologist, but served in a variety of functions in the leadership of the school, particularly having to do with uh, education, educational quality in students. He came to AAMC in 2007 uh, and provided the base for a lot of activities known to us, the student surveys, including the uh, graduation survey, which at least in the workforce world is very important, uh, but also a holistic review, developing and uh, promulgating it, and the missions management tool, which is not well known, but is a fabulous instrument run quietly by the AAMC to help deans and, and the decanate and leadership uh, analyze, uh, analyze the work uh, of their school in comparison to the schools of the country. It's a pleasure to be here and to be talking on this subject. Uh, I think this is a subject that's obviously of critical importance to all the medical schools and all the medical students uh, in the nation uh, to whether there will be an adequate number of residency slots for them when they complete their, their medical education. Um, but the, the discussion um, is not just about the, the fate of medical students, it's really also about related to the financing and reimbursement of graduate medical education. And it's become an issue beyond just an analytical issue about the adequacy of the numbers of GME slots. Uh, some of you may know there's been a relatively uh, active campaign for more federal GME funds. Uh, AAMC and AMA have been among the most active in this campaign. And they really argue that there's a need for more GME funds based on two issues. The first is whether there are students who've invested four years of their life and a lot of money to get a medical degree only to find that there is not enough, there are not enough 
residency positions for them, with residency being absolutely essential for them to go on to practice. Um, so there's a question, is there a squeeze? And there's been a good deal of politics around the suggestion that there is an inadequate number of residency positions. Uh, the other issue that is raised is whether we're facing a major physician shortage, and I'm not gonna get into that, but uh, we have published on that in academic medicine, and some question about w whether the nation is facing a major physician shortage. But again, these two arguments are the, the, the key, the core, sort of cornerstone of the argument for more federal funding. Um, as many of you know, Fitz and I and, and Katie Weider uh, published an article in the New England Journal of Medicine um, last uh, December, I believe, um, questioning um, what, or explaining why we don't think a GME squeeze is likely. And what I'm gonna do today is try and briefly run through why we came to that conclusion and what's the data that we're looking at um, so, let me start. The first is, uh, let me just say, th this, was not, this was not rocket science. It was, there, were some, there were some analytical challenges, uh, but what we needed to do was to, uh, to try and come up with a reasonable estimate projection of how many medical school graduates there will be in the future, and we went really about eight years out, uh, nine years out, and how many GME slots are there likely to be in the future. So what we did was we looked at the historical patterns, and um, for AA, AAMC and uh, ACOM, which represents the osteopathic schools, both produce regular reports on graduates and entrants. Um, we were further uh, helped by the fact that AAMC, um, for the last decade or so, has been doing an annual survey of medical schools uh, with the very specific question about what are your plans for enrollment over the next five years. As a survey, actually, we started when I was at AAMC because AAMC had called for the major expansion of medical school capacity, and we wanted to know what was likely to be happening. So I used the, the report that was published in 2015, uh, which actually pulls in some data collection, similar or parallel data collection that ACOM does on osteopathic schools. That had uh, re the results of the survey in 2014 which asked for five years out, and that, that gave us estimates for first year enrollment through 2019, and then we made some assumptions about what percent would graduate. Actually, we assumed 98% of the entrants would graduate four years later um, in order to estimate the number of graduates through 2013. So the fact is, the reality is that there are new medical schools, there is expansion of both medical and osteopathic education, the numbers of graduates are growing significantly. Uh, I'll take that as a, a, a very positive. You know, in 2004 um, th th and 2005, when I joined AAMC and Jordan Cohn was the president, and we strongly recommended that U.S. medical school capacity be increased. And we recommended an increase by a third. It's actually increasing by more than a third uh, now. So what we've concluded was that medical school graduates we're likely to grow from 22,500 to 29,500 by 2024. Um, and this is the, the numbers that we, um, we use. Now, this is both medical and osteopathic, and it does get a little confusing, particularly, and you'll see in a moment when you start looking at GME, including medical and osteopathic. But there is a steady progression, and, and the reality is that um, the, growth, the historical growth has been about 2.4%. The future growth may be a little bit higher because there are more schools who are beginning to have, that are coming online or came online that will be having graduates. Um, this, by the way, is from the ACGME. Um, the ACGME puts out a report at, after the end of each training year. Um, and what I just wanted to point out was, and these are the pipeline positions at the, at the higher level, was that there has been a clearly a steady growth in the pipeline positions. These are, these are positions for first year, first year residents that lead to a uh, board certification. So it excludes your preliminary programs that, that are not uh, leading to board certification. So we see there has been this steady growth. Um, the challenge for us on the GME projection is how do you handle osteopath? Unfortunately, AOA has not, uh, who was responsible for the certification of the uh, osteopathic training programs is not really, uh, their data is, is weak. Um, 
with a single accreditation system that's underway now, that's being, happening now, we will have better data in the future. So we had ACGMA data, which is really solid, and then we had AOA data, which is really weak. So what we did, we did this indirectly. We felt we had good data on AOA uh, osteopathic graduates. Um, and we had good data on how many osteopaths were going into ACGME training programs. And we assumed that 98% um, of the osteopaths were going to go on to GME. And so we took the number that we had, we were comfortable with that um, from AOA, I'm sorry, from ACOM on graduates, subtracted out the ACGME entrance, and then assumed that the remainder were going into AOA uh, accredited programs. So that's how we calculated the growth and looked at the growth over the past decade. And what we found is the growth in GME over the past decade was about 1.66%. And so our projection was really projecting the number of GME slots forward at 1.66% per year. There's obviously a lot of can have a discussion about will the past growth continue in the future. I will tell you that we feel that, the, that it is likely uh, the GME growth are self-funded positions. Um, some of those are VA-funded positions. Some of those are state-funded positions. It is quite possible that GME growth could end. Um, and uh, we, we looked at several scenarios, although the article only presented sort of the baseline. So th this is the result of the, the, the analysis. Um, the, the GME positions, again, growing uh, the, using the historical rate of 1.66. The, me the medical and osteopathic graduates uh, based on the, what was in the pipeline and the projections. And the remainder are the, what we call the excess pipeline positions, which are clearly being filled by IMGs currently, but are also obviously available to US medical school and osteopathic graduates. So even out to 2024, we felt there would be uh, more than 4,600 uh, positions above the number of US medical and osteopathic graduates. This is the line. Uh, and, and what you see is, yes, there's a squeeze, but it's a very, very slow squeeze. I mean, I think Henry and I came up with the con squeeze concept, and, um, and now we're paying for it. No. Um, so the, 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 I just wanted to show the, the three scenarios that we did look at. Um, so the, the bottom one, or the, the, on the chart, the bottom line, is if, if in 2013 there was no longer any further growth in graduate medical education positions, we see that in 2023, 20, 24, there would be more graduates than positions. But again, we don't believe that there is likely to be a sudden freeze and an absolute no growth. The middle one is, uh, uh, which is uh, scenario three, no, I'm sorry, scenario one um, was using the historical rate, which shows, uh, the prior figure showed that would have about 4,600 additional slots. And then the upper one, is uh, reflects uh, adding 3,700 new GME positions um, to the uh, pool. This was really, if you, many of you know, AAMC and others have advocated for legislation which would support, and they use the term, the number 15,000 new GME positions. The legislation isn't totally clear about how those 15,000 new positions would be allocated. We had to make some decision about how one might allocate it rationally, and we decided that since um, on average, GME these days are about four years, and you wouldn't want to put 15,000 PGY1s and not support them after that. So we calculated that it would be roughly 3,700 per year over four years to get to the 15,000. Um, that's theoretical. That's if one were to suddenly pass legislation opening up the, sort of the floodgates for additional graduate medical education. Um, this is another chart from ACGME. Again, it's just ACGME, not, um, uh, not osteopathic positions. What I really wanted to point out on, oops, on this one was the, th this line over here, which are foreign medical school graduates, um, which show that uh, even as recently as 2014-15, uh, there were 6,800 additional IMGs entering residency training. <coughs> and um, on this chart, the, the, the red on the, on the left are the, the projections that we made. And what we see is the ACGME total in uh, 2014 was actually 500 higher foreign medical school graduates than we had, would, had projected. <clears throat> the NRMP number, 
which is, is, a good, is a good number in the sense that it comes early, but it, as many of you know, historically many foreign medical school graduates would go outside of the NRMP. Now with the all-in policy, that number is getting to be more representative of the actual uh, IMGs entering. Uh, <clears throat> and we do have you know, the figure from 2016-17, this is the class that will be coming in, cohort coming in in June, um, of 6,600 IMGs. I, I will tell you that uh, when I was at AAMC, and we, we recommended the growth in medical school graduates, we, we really did expect to see a decrease in the number of our medical school graduates. I mean, one would assume that, um, that if you're particularly increasing medical school graduates at 2.5% per year, that they would get tighter. And I'm, I'm sort of still waiting, and I'm, I'm really taken aback that we haven't seen you know, even a slow decrease um, in the number of foreign medical school graduates entering. Um, so the bottom line, that, that there may be a squeeze coming, but it's a really relatively limited squeeze, at least through 2024. Um, you know, th this, this represents about 1.1 1 and, uh, 1 .1 or 1.15 positions in the in GME entry positions that are going to be available for every a US medical school graduate. We think the current trajectories still leave room for a reasonable number of foreign medical school graduates. So this isn't going to cut out all the foreign medical school graduates, but it would, it would limit them to a, to a certain extent. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the other reality is that even if you added 15,000 additional slots, there's no guarantee that U.S. medical school graduates at, who haven't gotten positions are going to get them. And I'll come back to that in one minute. The, I also think it's really important for us to keep in mind that the, the U.S. did sign a global agreement with the WHO with 182 other countries, which said we were going to do more to produce the workforce that we need rather than rely on migration <clears throat> and immigration from uh, particularly less developed countries. And I will tell you, medicine historically in America, we, about 25% of all our physicians come from foreign, are graduates of foreign medical schools. That's totally different than any other health profession. I mean, nursing, even when we were facing shortages in nursing and there were a lot of nurses coming from the Philippines, you know, we were only, talk, we were only talking about in terms of the overall nurse workforce, five to eight percent of our nurses coming from abroad. So medicine is an outlier. And so relying in, in you know, again, 25 percent, what, what we've had historically is really um, uh, not in line with other professions. And then I would argue that I think the main beneficiaries of uh, Adding many new slots will be the Caribbean schools, which from my perspective, any LCME school would really question why would we want to make it easier uh, for schools that have gone out of their way to avoid our accreditation process. Uh, final slide. So one of the questions they ask um, is really, um, why is it that there were 6,300 IMGs selected over some US graduates? Um, I think a really, really critical question. So if people are going to be concerned about those several hundred that didn't get residency positions. Why was it? Why didn't they get it? So I don't know. In some cases, I know it's specialty choice. And so I know if we were going to offer 800, uh, and I, I used to have this number at the tip of my tongue, you know, there was something like 800 first-year orthopedic positions, and we had 900 people, this was two years ago, who only listed orthopedics. Well, you know, someone's going to lose out if that's the way um, their specialty selections go. Uh, I think we should be looking at uh, why do some GME programs prefer IMGs over the U.S. Uh, medical school graduates? Um, does it say something about the GME programs? Does, does it say something about the U.S. medical students who aren't matched? Um, <clears throat> does it say anything about the schools of, that prepared those students if their graduates don't match? I mean, clearly, clearly better um, advice is going to help in terms of uh, encouraging U.S. medical students to make good choices. Um, well, let me just say, I don't think the goal is to encourage medical students to just apply for more and more and more. I mean, that, you know, I've, I've already heard the, 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 the cries from program directors of being overwhelmed with the number of applications. This is an aside, sort of interesting, the, the NRMP was sort of designed to discourage, and the pricing, I'm sorry, the ARIS and NRMP was designed to discourage people from just applying to hundreds of programs. Um, but the pricing structure doesn't seem to have discouraged people from applying to, to many, many programs. So 
I think this is an important issue, um, but the answer isn't to produce more graduate medical education positions. The answer is to look at uh, more closely why is it that some people aren't getting positions uh, and what can we do <clears throat> to sort of facilitate that. I will tell you that if we really believe, and I'm looking forward to Henry's presentation uh, about what ultimately happens to people who don't get matched, um, if we really believe that U.S. medical school graduates and osteopathic graduates have an absolute right to residency positions, then we need to change our residency match program. There's no reason why we couldn't change the match program and say U.S. graduates go first. Um, or maybe we have two rounds and uh, U.S. graduates go first and then others go first. I mean, there are ways to deal with this if you believe that every single medical school graduate deserves a residency position. I don't think we're there yet. Uh, so I think we need to understand, again, why gra some graduates aren't getting into to GME. And I'm going to stop there. I'm delighted to be here. And, and this was like the perfect setup. I mean, Ed taught me everything I know. And he just gave me the perfect setup. So, so the answer, of course, is, is not um, uh, what it might uh, seem. And I'm going to explain uh, a, a research project that I was involved in uh, over the last couple of years at the AMC to help uh, clarify, I hope, help clarify the situation. Uh, the numbers uh, Ed quoted, by the way, are, are low numbers. We know now, uh, and just, just uh, for those of you in the audience who may not know the rules, unlike dentistry, medicine, you ca cannot practice in any state, District of Columbia, American Samoa, whatever, without at least one year of GME, um, and in some states, two or three years. There is a law in Missouri that they're playing with um, that, that might get around that, but historically, you've got to have to train. And so when you go to dental school, there are still many states you can go out and hang up your shingle and practice dentistry in the United States. But medicine, that's not true. So the PGY1 postgraduate year one is a virtual requirement, plus minus this craziness in Missouri, to practice medicine, clinical medicine, in any, any constituency in the US. OK. So uh, what, what we did, uh, this was uh, three of my colleagues and I, Imam Shirali, who's a wonderful young PhD researcher uh, in our diversity group. Uh, Jeff Young, who's uh, the head of student affairs and programs at the AMC, and Mark DeVay, who's the head of diversity. We, we decided what we wanted to look at was specifically what happens to these people who don't start GME when they graduate. So what's the fate of unplaced graduates? Uh, we had a special interest uh, in the uh, underrepresented medicine minority graduates. We created this little working group, and we, we used s several um, uh, only four data resources, and I just want to go through them because it's critical to this talk. We used our student, AMC student record system, which is a great system. So we did not look at the DO graduates. And our system uh, really tracks every kid from the day they enter medical school till the day they leave. We used, so, since the ACGME, the, the uh, accrediting group for graduate medical education, won't give us the names of those people. They give us the numbers, as Ed just showed but they won't give you the names. We have a separate system that we co-own, the AMA and the AAMC called GME Track. And what's cool about GME Track is it's a snapshot. It's one night a year, it's New Year's Eve. It's as far away from July 1st as it can be. And we ask the program directors who's on duty, not, not who's on call, <laughs> but you know, who's in your program on New Year's Eve. So it captures some people who maybe start a little late, start a little early, we don't care when they start. We just want to know what body is uh, being paid by you on December 31st. Uh, we look at the AMA master file, but only for people in practice. We, the resident file is completely useless because it's just corrupted. They just put the graduate list in and pretend they're in residency. And then we used, of course, the federal uh, provider database, which is important because there are some people you pick up like the oral maxillofacial surgeons, those crazy people who go to med school and dental school, God knows why, but they're wonderful people and we need them, those of us who need OMF surgery, and they get their GME in the dental world, so they never show up in the medical world. And then we looked at the number of graduates, then it turned out, this, this was like the key event of my life, there was a lady down the hall, it's like everything at the AMC, who, I, I was walking down the hall one day, I said, does anybody know in the student record system where graduates go when they graduate? She said, oh yeah, I know, because when they graduate, they have to fill in 
a field giving the code for the PGY1 position. I said, Lindsay, you're kidding me. <laughs> so she has the data forever. It took her 20 minutes to get 10 years worth of data for me. But of every graduate, so we know how many people are unplaced each year, and that's going to be one of the key points of this talk. We looked at race and ethnicity. We looked at gender. We looked at the MCAT of entry to med school. We looked at school groups, the three historically black uh, medical schools, the four Puerto Rico schools, and also, this is going to upset some people, but we looked at the MCAT, what we call top 10 and MCAT bottom 10. So excluding the HBCUs and the Puerto Rico schools, we looked at how many people who went to Harvard, WashU, Stanford didn't start residency versus the bottom 10, the lowest average uh, entering MCAT, which are basically southeastern um, public schools, a group of southeastern public schools. This is all uh, MD schools, our member schools. Then, if they weren't a uh, place of graduation, when did they appear in GME track? So, when did they show up for the first time? What December 31st did Janie or Johnny first show up? And then we supplemented GME track with the master file and the uh, CMS uh, uh, National Provider Database. And then we calculated the actual percentage of people who graduated from med school and 10 years later had not done one year of clinical training, so were not qualified to practice medicine, clinical medicine. Okay, so very quickly now, pick up speed, and the numbers are a little small, but the key point about this slide is it's 10, actually it's 11 years now, the percentage is 3%. So 97% of US MD graduates start GME the year they graduate, and this has not changed at all. It was 2.7%, 2.9%. The peak, if you can see well enough, was 3.5% in 2008, 2009. And uh, this past year, uh, two, uh, 14, 15, we don't have the 16 graduates yet because they haven't graduated, was 3.1%. So we know that it's, the NRMP number doesn't capture the people who go through the match that the military runs. It doesn't capture people who, who match in the SOAP or a supplemental process after the match. We know that consistently, and going along with Ed's point, this has not gotten any worse. 3% of our graduates, MD graduates, do not start GME on average the year they graduate. If you look more closely, and I'll, I'll walk you through this because it's a busy slide, at uh, American Indian, Alaska Native uh, graduates, a Asian graduates, black graduates, Hispanic graduates, non-citizen graduates, et cetera. So if you look at the black graduates, it is higher, 5.7%. Hispanic graduates, 5.6%. Uh, white graduates, a little lower, 1.9%. Overall, 3%. And that's consistent through the years. Interestingly, if you take out the uh, island schools, the Puerto Rico schools, the Hispanic graduates actually come way down to 3.2%. But if you take out the uh, HBCU schools, it has no effect at all. So the, the black uh, students who go to Morehouse, Howard, uh, Meharry do as well as the black students who go to any of the other uh, member schools. Uh, oh, this is the top 10, bottom 10, okay? You're gonna, you're gonna love this. If you go to one of the bottom 10 schools, you're 2.7%. You're more likely to start GME than the average graduate of an American MD granting school. If you go to a top 10 school, you have a 4% chance of not starting. You're less likely to start GME the year you graduate. Think about that for a minute, folks. Stick that in your pipe. We'll come back to that. We're not done with that. And again, the overall is uh, 3%, not starting. Okay, gender, everybody sitting down? Anybody want to make a sexist comment? <laughs> Don't. You think more women want to sit out, maybe have a baby, one of those uh, little stereotype things? Wrong. 2.4% of women graduates don't start, 3.5% of men. Every year, more, a higher percentage of men than women do not start GME over 11 years. Now, it may be the orthopedic phenomenon. You know, I just mentioned they want to all go into orthopedics or whatever. 
but this is this is you know this is a 50 percent, 40 percent difference. This is not a small. This is a highly statistically significant difference. Uh, so the women graduates of the U.S. MD Granting School, 90, you know, 7.6 percent of them are starting. Only 96.5 percent of the men. Think about that. Uh, MCAT, you know, having a low MCAT is, uh, is not uh, really in your favor, but I think everybody knew that. Okay, now this is GME track. So when do the graduates show up who weren't there when they graduated? So the 0405 graduates show up on December 31st, 06, which is what you'd expect for the most part. So, uh, there were a hundred and this was by far the biggest year, so that's 18 months after graduation. So that's the second year, not the first year. 175 show up of the five, six graduates, 195 of the six, seven graduates. So you get to see the trend. And if you go through, keep going through, you know, picking up dribs and drabs, the 0405 graduates, uh, a lot more are picked up through the years. We'll, we'll do the sums in a minute. But the, but the mode, the common mode, is to show up that December 31st, in fact, is uh, 18 months. So it's a, you're starting basically a year after you, quote unquote, should have started. So, so we followed this through then for, for the early years of the study to the final numbers. So here's uh, the first year, there were 418 unplaced. Um, and again, the number of graduates has gone up. So just, let's just stop for a minute to go back to Ed's talk. So we started a decade ago with 15,760 MD graduates. We're up to 18,075. And actually, the number, um, I'll go back very quickly. Last year was 18,705. So here's the total increase. It's gone up by 3,000 in a decade. And again, the percentage hasn't changed of those not starting, hasn't changed at all. And so here, here are the final numbers. So if you look back at the um, 0405 graduates, there were 418 who were unplaced at graduation. We found 294 of them, almost three quarters in GME tracks sometime. Uh, a couple we found in the AMA master file, eight in the practitioner database, uh, and only 89 we, we never saw in GME anywhere or practice. And it's consistent, again, it's about 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7%. So the actual number of MD graduates who never get at least one year of training to qualify to practice is less than 1%. And this is what I did. So this was my main contribution to the study. I actually looked at those 89, 2006 graduates. I used free uh, resources. Google is great. Doximity is useless. LinkedIn is moderate. Facebook is fabulous. The Times Sunday wedding section is the best. <laughs> best. Ancestry is actually wasn't, wasn't worth the my, I joined for, for myself. But anyway, I, it really wasn't very helpful. Many of them I could find with phone numbers, but I didn't call. I thought a call to someone saying, hi, it's Henry from the AMC. I see you graduated from med school in 2006, and I don't know what the H you're doing. Could you just tell me? <laughs> I, I didn't think that that would go over well, so I didn't call anybody. So of these 89 graduates, I could not find 38. So 38 uh, have basically uh, dropped off the face of the earth as far as free internet uh, uh, access, findability. So what about the other? 51 or so. 21 are in the not-for-profit healthcare non-clinical world. MD, PhDs at the NIH, somebody who's a computational biologist, this is just examples, computational biologist at Harvard, but that's a good chunk of them. 14 are in the for-profit world, Oracle Investment Management Company, he's an MBA, partner in flagship ventures, whatever that was, elected a 2014 young global leader by the World Economic Forum. He's doing all right, or he or she, right? Six are in practice in Canada, so people uh, who went directly to GME at McGill or Toronto or, or Vancouver would have never you know, been in our system. 
but I found them online, the, the, all the provinces are the greatest, so that's easy. Uh, two are in practice in the US. I don't know how they got there. I don't want to know. Uh, one is in practice in Taiwan. There were you know, the small minority of authors, preachers, et cetera. And there were three uh, OMF surgeons, uh, oral maxillofacial uh, surgeons. Where did these 89 people who have never had a year of GME, where did they go to med school? Well, two went to school on the island, one at Curie Bay, one at Ponce. None went to the historic black universities. None, that's zero, went to one of our low MCAT schools. But a healthy 21 went to our top MCAT schools. And Harvard was the lead, Columbia, Stanford, Hopkins, Wash U. So clearly, and um, I've seen ads now from McKinsey and other uh, consulting firms, they are recruiting at med schools at graduation just like they are at business school. So things are changing, folks. So this is the end of my talk, but we have a little quiz, okay? And since I'm at GW, but I didn't want to pick on anybody else's med school, I'm only picking on my med school. So these are four famous alumni of the Columbia College of Physicians and Surgeons. Uh, who's older in the room? Fitz, who is this? Huh? Yeah, you better, you better call your help. This is Armand Hammer, okay? Armand Hammer, MD, uh, graduate of the Columbia College of Physicians and Surgeons, class of 1921, just a year or two before Fitz went to med school. <laughs> and long-term CEO of Occidental Petroleum. The, the backstory on Armand Hammer is that he graduated from college in, in sort of off cycle in December of uh, 1917. His dad ran a small petroleum company called Occidental, which wasn't making any money. And his dad said, well, you're not starting med school till September, you know, and there's this new guy, Lenin or something like that, who's in Russia or someplace like that, and they probably need some oil or something like that. So why don't you go over, see if you could sell him some oil. So Armin goes over, he's 22 years old, sells Lenin a bunch of oil, goes to med school when he comes back, but by that time, he's making so much money selling oil to the Russians, he never did nothing. Our graduate. Okay. Who's this guy? Now, Ed, this is in your generation. Polly, come on. Famous graduate, Columbia College of Physicians and Surgeons. Come on, everybody in the room knows this person. This is Robin Cook, MD, class of 66, author of Coma and 30 other books, uh, you know, most of which have short names like death or dying or whatever. <laughs> but he's done fine. He's done fine. Okay, for the younger people, no, you're out of this now, Fitz and Ed. Who's this? Come on. He's on TV every week. Come on. What's the show? Just the show will do. Come on. You all watch this show. Don't pretend you don't. This is Matt Eisman, MD, class of 98, host of American Ninja Warrior. <laughs> what could be a better preparation for being the host of American Ninja Warrior? than to go to med school. I don't know. Matt's actually the son of a good, of a good friend of mine. And uh, he called, Matt called his dad, who's a famous TV researcher in Denver, called his dad a week before he graduated and said, I want to be a comic. I'm going to Hollywood. So, and just the ladies won't uh, feel left out. Blonde, right. This is Jen Ashton, a Good Morning America correspondent. She's on all the time for, for uh, she is actually a, a trained in OBGYN, um, for mostly for women's uh, obstetrical, gynecological, whatever issues. But anyway, these are basically classmates. They're friends of my daughter's, who actually does practice a little medicine. But, but anyway, I just wanted to give you an example of where some, uh, if you wish, Ivy League type uh, people are, uh, are heading. That's it. Uh,